Well, it's great to welcome you here this morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's good to have you with us. And as I say, if you're a visitor this morning, particularly welcome to you. It's nice to see you here this morning. Right, before we go any further, I'll ask Jeff to come and lead us in prayer now. Lead us before the throne of grace. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, just a few verses from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing with joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is God and we are the people of his pasture and the flock under his care. Let us pray. We come before you, Lord, this morning, and we give you thanks for who you are. As the psalm reminds us, you are the rock of our salvation. We thank you that we are able to come here together to worship you. We thank you for your, our friends and family and fellowship. But we thank you most of all for Jesus, our Saviour, and for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for your care and protection over the past weeks and months. We thank you for the love that you continue to show us and your guidance. We pray for those who are not well at this time or are waiting to go into hospital for treatment. Pray that you will heal them and sustain them as they wait. Be sure, Lord, it is a, a worrying time, so we ask that you would draw close to them. We remember those who are suffering in this world. We think of Ukraine and the devastation that's been wrought along that border there. Pray that there will be some resolution to it soon, Lord. We pray also for Turkey and Syria. There are so many deaths, Lord, that it's hard for our minds to process that amount of people dying. We pray for all those who've lost loved ones. We pray for those who have been injured. We pray for all the teams who are still working to clear the rubble and recover bodies, Lord. We pray that you'll be with them also, because obviously it's not a a very nice task to have to perform, Lord, so we pray for them. We pray for all the relatives who have lost loved ones either in Turkey or through other countries where they've had friends and family. Pray that uh, the effort that's been made will bring food and shelter and aid to that particular area, Lord. We would also remember our brothers and sisters in other lands who are suffering because of their faith and unable to meet as freely as we can. We again ask that you will be with them, keep them safe and bless them as they meet together. We pray for our country. Again, Lord, there is a lot of difficulties at the moment with strikes and uh, financial difficulty for people. Lord, we ask again for wisdom for the government and the ministers who are dealing with these situations that they may help and support people who are in dire need, I think, Lord, at times. Pray for our time together today. We ask that it will be a blessed time as we meet and fellowship and sing praises to your name. We pray for Will as he brings the message to us later. We ask that we will have open hearts and ears to listen to what you want to say to us this morning. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. The story of Easter, the Last Supper. This is Jesus. hey -o! Who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like calming storms 
and even raised people from the dead. Uh, wahoo! At this time, the Jewish people were celebrating a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses, when God brought his people out of Egypt. So Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate. The disciples asked Jesus where he wanted to eat the Passover meal that night. Jesus said, as you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Hello. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, uh, hi. The teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. The disciples found everything to be just as Jesus had said. Later that evening, Jesus arrived with the 12 disciples. They sat down to eat, and Jesus said that he was happy to be with everyone. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. He said, Take it, for this is my body, which is given for you. Jesus told them to do this to help remember him. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he said to his disciples, This is my blood. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Jesus said, One of you eating with me here will betray me. He told them that things were supposed to happen this way, but that great sadness would await the one who betrays him. The disciples were very upset and asked, Am I the one? Who is he talking about? Judas asked Jesus, Am I the one? And Jesus said, You have said it. One of the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, who is it? Jesus said it was the one who he would give the bread to. He gave the bread to Judas, and Jesus said, Hurry and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant, so Judas left at once to betray Jesus. Then Jesus comforted and encouraged the disciples. He promised them that they would have a helper come when Jesus was gone. They all sang a song to God together. from um, St. Mark, chapter 14, verses 12 to 31. <clears throat> On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make preparation for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room? Where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. <clears throat> the, 
They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I, surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who drips bread into the, dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them. They all drank, <coughs> they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many, he said. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, <coughs> I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Today, yes, tonight, before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter, <coughs> Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Amen. Right, let's pray before we look at these words this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this, your word that we've just read. And Lord, we, we recognise this is, this is kind of holy ground always, Lord, when we look at your word. But particularly when we look at this Last Supper, as we call it. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to understand it. Give us hearts and ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, um, last week we started Mark 14 which I said then was kind of the beginning of the end, really, of the gospel. Um, and we've been in Mark's gospel now for quite some time, haven't we? probably about 18 months altogether, on and off. And um, this is the beginning of Mark's passion narrative, they call it. The, time, the, the, the uh, bits of the Bible in the gospels which talk about Jesus, the days leading up to Jesus' death. So in particular, the Last Supper, the Upper Room, the trials, and then the, uh, the crucifixion, of course, Gethsemane, the crucifixion, and then the resurrection. It'll lead us triumphantly, eventually, to Easter, and we hope to finish it all then. So last week we looked at how it began, and it began with Mark kind of these couple of um, contrasts, really. Uh, the, the devotion of a woman who wanted to give everything to Jesus and broke an alabaster jar of ointment to, to, to spread over his body and uh, to show her worship, extravagant worship, and how Jesus commended her for that. And then, really, the betrayal of, G of Judas, which we're going to look at again a bit this morning, uh, in contrast to that. And really, as we come towards the crucifixion and the resurrection and the cross, Calvary, Easter, as we come to all of that, this is the culmination of this cosmic battle that's going on. And that kind of little picture last week was a, 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 just a, a, a small picture of how that works out in the hearts of men and women on earth. For one, it was devotion. One who come towards Jesus had walked towards him and wanted to give everything towards him and devotion and commendation and, and acceptance from Jesus. And, uh, but for the other, Judas, who decided to walk away from Jesus because uh, and, and, evil was in his heart and it's, it's condemnation, not commendation, but condemnation from Jesus. And we'll see more of that this week. So then it moves on and Jesus starts, takes them and wants to celebrate the Passover. Now we've said that all these events that we've been looking at in Mark's Gospel for quite a few months now actually, <coughs> since before Christmas, are in the last week of Jesus' life, as we said. And so it's, um, it's now uh, the time for the Passover meal. And there's, there's, there's a school of thought still around today in liberal circles that Jesus, you know, wasn't, was kind of, uh, kind of almost a pathetic figure really. In the sense that he was, he came to change everything and to say all these wonderful things, but in the end was crushed by the world he came to save. One of the, I read this week apparently, one of the greatest, the one who spoke about this uh, a lot and wrote it in one of his books, which, um, which formed this, was a fellow called Albert Schweitzer. Have you ever heard of him? And, uh, and he wrote about Jesus who came to turn the wheel of history and the wheel turned on him and crushed him and he was helpless to stop it, kind of thing. 
That's a kind of liberal view. But we should be... Um, but his view was, he, he wasn't saying Jesus was not worth anything. We should just be inspired by his willingness to want to try, almost. Sad, isn't it, really? And then we get this view of the Gospels, which you wouldn't find... That, that kind of picture of Jesus nowhere seen. And what we'll see this morning is that Jesus is in complete control of everything that happens. Always has been. But in particular in this last week, when things seem to be getting out of control... And he seems to be at the mercy of authorities and rulers and betrayers and everyone else. He actually isn't. He's in complete control of everything, organising it in this way. So Jesus will be crushed, but he will be crushed because it's the will of his father to crush him. It was prophesied in Isaiah 53 and verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And as we look at all these words this morning, there will be many more little verses like that that are hard for us to get our head round. Because these are deep words and deep truths. And there's a lot of mystery here in the relationship between the Godhead, Father, Son and Spirit, but also in the God's relationship with us as sovereign and our understanding of that and also our response to that and our free will to do the things and to make choices in this life. And we see this happening time and time again. And we still see it happening today. But as the time draws nearer for Jesus to be crucified and to be placed in a tomb and to rise again, we see this, these kind of instances increasing in the life of all the disciples. And in particular, of course, today we're going to think of, of Judas. But also Peter and the others will see it there as well. God's sovereign will and our free choice to do things. And I can't say that I'm going to answer that question for you today because nobody's been able to. Because who knows the mind of God? These are deep mysteries and we sometimes have to accept the fact that God is above what we know. But God has, has given us, we've said already in this little series, the main things are the plain things, remember? And the plain things are the main things. And God wants us to know what he wants us to know and he makes it clear here. So we're going to look at that a little bit this morning as well. So Jesus is making sure here in this passage that we've just read that everything is right and ready and goes to plan. Jesus in control, first of all, verses 12 to 16. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the, the Passover? Which we now call the Last Supper, of course. And this Passover time was a very, very excitable time in Jerusalem. There were thousands, but perhaps over a million people in Jerusalem at this time, some, some scholars have said. We don't really know. What we do know is that um, Josephus, one of the, the Jewish historians, said in AD 66 there were 255,600 Passover lambs sacrificed that day. That's a lot, isn't it? Um, and so there was a lot of people in uh, Jerusalem wanting to sacrifice, wanting to celebrate the Passover. It was meant to be, according to the law, celebrated within the walls of, of the holy city of Jerusalem. And that's why they all came there. And it was a, it was a massive celebration. It, it was a cause for celebration because the whole thing was to remind them of what God had done when he rescued them from Egypt years ago, their ancestors from Egypt, and brought them out of slavery and into their promised land, which is where they were living now. And so this whole Passover celebration was, was given to them by God to remember what God had done for them, how he'd caused them, he'd, and, you know, the... the the, the gospel picture within that is massive. And we're going to look, after we finish this series and after Easter, we're going to spend some time in the book of Exodus. And we're going to see how this whole drama of history is a picture of the gospel. Uh, but we'll see that in the future. I don't want to take uh, any thoughts away from that at this, uh, this morning. But, um, but Peter, sorry, Mark mentions a new, on four occasions in this little passage that we've just read, uh, that this is the Passover time. And he wants us to understand that it's significant that this is all happening at Passover time in order to teach us a little bit more about Jesus, as we say. So it happens on the first day of unleavened bread. And we mentioned that feast last week, didn't we? It happens just before the Passover. When they start eating flatbreads, bread without any yeast, leaven in it. Because that's a picture of what happened when uh, the, 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 uh, the Hebrews, the ancient Hebrews, that were, God rescued them from Egypt. They had to take all 11 out of the house. It was a picture of getting rid of sin, 
that's what they had that's what the picture of it was for and so that was part of the deal and so this was a feast of unleavened bread that they had and they were eating it a day or so before but on the Thursday if you like of Holy Week that's when they sacrificed what they called the Paschal or the Passover lamb the lamb that was that they would have done all those years ago, killed the lamb according to how God had said to them, and spread the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, to signal that they were having faith in the God who had told them to do this. And as a result of that, the angel of death would pass over their houses and not bring death to them. And 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 they were as a result of that, they were rescued from Israel, of, uh, rescued from Egypt, of course. And so that's kind of what it was like. So it's a huge celebration. It was a bit like Christmas Eve would be here. Lots of preparations going on in lots of houses all over Jerusalem where people where lambs are being slaughtered as we've just been said and tables were being prepared a bit like the video we saw and that's why the disciples asked Jesus about this but Jesus then gives them and here's the control thing precise instructions for what to do uh, a bit like remember when he entered the Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and he sent them in to find a donkey here it was go find the room follow a guy who's going to be carrying a water pot that's unusual because it would normally be the women or a slave who would be carrying the water. But so you're fine. As you go to the city, there's going to be a million people in there, but you will see a guy carrying a water pot. Follow him. Didn't say talk to him. Follow him. He'll take you to a house. And when you get to that house, you go to ask the guy who owns the house. The teacher wants his room. Where is it um, for tonight's Passover? And he'll show you where it is. Now, it's possible that Jesus actually had been into the city and sorted all this out. It doesn't need to be a miracle here. But Jesus, again, Mark has given us this picture that Jesus is in control. He's organising everything. He's the servant, organising the meal that's going to celebrate his own death. Organising the meal that's going to tell the disciples about what is going to happen and what this Passover, this new covenant means now for them. And so he sends off disciples, to, into two disciples. Luke tells us it was Peter and John. And they make an unknown man. They carry this, carrying the jar exactly as they said, found the room exactly as Jesus had said. A large room was prepared. No need for a miracle, as I said. Jesus completely in control. He's not panicking. He's not striving and struggling at this point. He's completely in control, doing his father's will. Taking control of this awful situation that was about to happen. When all these people in the background are plotting against him and wanting to kill him, Jesus in complete control. We need to keep hold of that this morning because there's a message in there for us as well. They, the, the disciples would have prepared and roasted the lamb according to the, the way that they were meant to be doing it, as I say, to a picture of their deliverance in, in Exodus and uh, when they were brought out of Egypt. And that's what they would have done as they took the lamb. They would celebrate that and remember, remember all that God had done for them in this way. And of course, the lamb is the central piece of the whole celebration. And we are, of course, told by John in his gospel, uh, chapter 1 and verse 29, when he saw Jesus coming, what did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, these words roll off our tongue. But fancy describing somebody as that. And John, at that point, through the Holy Spirit, had his eyes open and realised that Jesus was going to be the new rescuer. The one who's going to come down, be sent by God to his people, as Moses was. Be equipped by God in every way to be the rescuer and then lead the people out in a miraculous way through his death and resurrection into glory. But in order to do that, the lamb had to be slain and, and that lamb's blood had to be spread on the doorposts. And Jesus, right at the very start, Mark, uh, sorry, John uh, identifies him as the one who will be the lamb who was slain and his blood over our lives, if you like, will be the reason why God doesn't uh, we, we don't face death, but we face eternal, we have eternal life in Jesus. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's what it was all about, wasn't it? Jesus in total control of all of these things, all the events leading up to it. Even the brutality of the cross, as we'll see as we go through this. I want, it's going to be a recurring theme, and I want you to understand that as we look at this. Jesus is no victim here. He is a victor. He's the one who's got his stamp all over it. And, for, and fulfilling all of the prophecies that were made about the suffering servant of God in Isaiah, the prophet in the Old Testament. Look at the verse that's going to come up on the board just now. 1 Peter 1 verse 18 to 20. Because later on Peter writes this letter 
and he realises all of this. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the, the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. So Peter realises now as he's writing to his, to the, again, the same Hebrew people who uh, we were talking about looking at the book of Hebrews recently. He's writing to those people and he's saying, this Jesus who was crucified, yes, it, the world might think he was a pathetic figure and lost his life, but he wasn't. He was in complete control because actually he was slain, as it were, before the foundation of the world. God knew he was going to send. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He provided a lamb. There was a picture of that with Abraham and Isaac. Remember when Abraham sacrifices Isaac on the mountain in the Old Testament, if you know the story? And just as Abraham was about to sacrifice his only son, God provided himself a lamb so that he could do that. God, the provider of this. And so this picture is right through the scriptures and it's a wonderful picture, the bloodline that goes right through scripture here. And so we see Jesus fulfilling that role of being the lamb of God completely. Even, and so the important thing is that, again, the overarching thing is Jesus in control. He's not at the mercy of circumstances. He's not being pushed around. He's not having to react to things. He's on the front foot. And he's going to deliberately go and give his life as a ransom for many. As the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's important for us to remember. Because there are times when life for us would seem out of control. And Jesus is our king and he's still leading us today and he's still in control. He's never ever taken his hand off the wheel, to quote Schweitzer. He hasn't. He's still in control of all things. He is above all things. So you read, as we were reading the other night as we were looking at the membership thing about who Jesus is. Uh, in Colossians 3, isn't it, about where that wonderful passage of who Jesus is, the firstborn of all creation. In him all the fullness of God dwells. And we are made complete because of him. He is before all things and he controls all things, it says. And that's the Jesus who we worship this morning. That's why we want to know him. Only Jesus, because he is the one who's in control. We, we wouldn't surrender our, submit our, 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 um, our, ourselves, or we shouldn't, to anyone else. Because no one else will control things like he does. He knows what's best for us. And he goes before us. Jesus in control but the second part of this then is the the poignant moment of jesus betrayal and we're going to revisit judas here although by name i don't think he's actually mentioned in this passage here as we read it verse chapter 14 verse 17 to 21 when evening came jesus arrived with the 12 and while they were reclining at the table eating he said truly i tell you one of you will betray me one who is eating with me again jesus in control I'm telling you, truly, truly, truly moment. Remember we said that? Really important. Jesus saying, listen, this meal is going according to plan, exactly as it should be. It's a Passover meal. You've celebrated it many times. But truly, I tell you, Jesus drops a bombshell. One of you will betray me. It's not might, but will betray me. It's all in my hands. Again, poignant words. Jesus was not caught out by Judas' betrayal. Mark's account of, of this whole scene is quite dramatic, but very brief compared to, to the other gospel accounts as well, uh, as Mark is, is, is prone to do, really, isn't he? As we've seen all the way through the gospel. So there's no upper room discourse, there's no talk about anything else. It's just straight to the point, isn't it? Just the betrayal and the supper itself. Now, the interesting thing here is it was a big room, and there's probably more than 12 disciples and Jesus there. Because later on in verse 20, he now, when he said this about who someone will betray him, they were all going, is it me, is it me? And he narrows it down, he said, no, it'll be one of the twelve, implying that there was more people there saying, is it me? So lots of Jesus' disciples and friends were there, but the close group of the twelve were there too. And Jesus saying, no, the person who will betray me is in this close-knit group, the ones who I've spent most time with, the ones I've spent three years ministering with, my partners, my friends. The ones who walk with me. And as we said last week, the one who said all the right things. Some one of these people who nobody knows who it is. They don't realise who it is. Because Judas, as we said last week, had said all the right things. Had done all the right things. Had, had seemed like just one of, the, one of the gang, as it were. And how easy 
we said last week it is for us to be like that. But then Judas comes and, 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 and it's going to be him who betrays him, as we know, but they don't know that. And the way it would have happened is they would have had this table, probably similar to what you saw in a cartoon, actually, a low table, and they'd all sort of lie around the table. They would be prostrate, so they wouldn't look like the picture where they're all, we've got a table, and there's 12 of them in the room, and they're all sitting on one side of it. That's a bit mad, isn't it? They wouldn't do that anyway. But they're all lying around the table, and the food would be in the middle, and they would be reaching in to grab the food and to serve one another. And there would be bread, and there'd be wine, and there'd be herbs, and there'd be sauce there, and there would be the lamb there too, and that's what they would feast on. it. But it was all very controlled and very organised. There was four different points in the meal where they would drink the cup, and the different cups meant for different things. And each one was to help them to remember a specific aspect of how God dealt with them and brought them out, the promise to take them, the actual point of taking them, and so on and so forth. So it was all very orchestrated. It was a, it was a ceremonial meal, but it was still a fellowship meal in that sense. And uh, so, so that's how they would be doing it. And Jesus, as you say, drops his bombshell into the middle of all this ordinariness. Yes, celebration, but ordinariness of it. Now, the disciples knew that stuff was going on because they, Jesus had spoken about it before. But to drop this in, one of you will betray me must have been awful for them. Imagine being there. He knew Jesus, of course, who it was going to be. He always did know. Go back in John's Gospel in chapter 6. Jesus speaking to his disciples and identifying them and saying, one of you is a devil. He already knew who it was going to be. And it begs the question, well, why did he choose him then? Why would you choose to have someone who you knew was going to betray you? And then why would you invite him to the last meal you're going to have here on earth? And why would you do all those different things? This is where we said about this coming together of God's sovereign purpose and man's sovereign will and all these different things coming together God's purposes as the crescendo is coming as the battle is intensifying if you like the spiritual battle we see it here don't you uh, in this area Psalm 41 and verse 9 again it's from the Old Testament now of course but this was what it says even my close friend someone I trusted one who shared my bread has turned against me or lifted up his heel against me it's all in God's plan doesn't make sense to us, does it? It seems like a, a strange plan in so many ways. The disciples are aghast with this, of course, because they're saying, well, is it me? Because they don't know. Why don't they know? Obviously, they've seen nothing different about each other. And are they saying, is it me? Because they think Jesus is going to sort of uh, put them in a position where they can't do anything other than betray him. Or are they thinking, we might do this by accident. We don't know what's going on. What does Jesus know here? And you can imagine the consternation that's going around in those people's hearts. Is it me? I wouldn't do that. We've all just said, you know, we, we, we'll never leave you. What did they think he meant by all of that? Jesus narrows it down in verse 20. We've already said, one of you who is the 12. And then verse 21, which is probably one of the most significant verses in the New Testament, really. One of the many, but this is one of them. The Son of Man will go just as it is written. Again, control. Jesus in control, God is in control of these circumstances. So, the Son of Man, yes, one of you will betray me, but the Son of Man is going to go just as it was prophesied, he would. Just as it's been written, he would. And nothing's going to change the circumstances of that. So this betrayal is all part of that, is what he's saying there. But then he says, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he'd not been born. It's an incredible statement, isn't it, really? Son of man's going just as it's written. A summary statement that God is behind all of this. Prophesied and fulfilled from eternity. From before the foundation of the world. But woe to that man. He's not responsible for this. Judas in one sense. He's not the one whose his betrayal has kind of turned the events of history. God was always in control of this. So he's not responsible for that. But he's complicit in it. Jesus is crucified by God's determined will. But... Judas is responsible for his rejection. He had opportunity, as far as he was concerned, to turn away. Many opportunities to turn towards Jesus and run to him. Confronted by his sin. If you look at John's account of this meal, uh, again, without going into all the details, but there's that poignant moment where Jesus mentions it here in this passage that he, it's the one who I've dipped the bread in the bowl with. And it's like he dips the bread in the bowl and gives the bread 
to Judas. And he, he would have to look him in the eye, wouldn't he? There's an opportunity, even at that last moment, for Judas to turn and run toward, to be confronted with his, his sin that he's about to commit. The evil that's in his heart. And he could have run to Jesus, but John says he turned away and walked out into the night. That's a responsibility that Judas took for himself. But how does God's sovereignty in over everything and in being in control of this link to Judas's choice? And the answer is I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. And I don't think any of us do. But as far as we're concerned, we have choices to make all the time. God's sovereign will is at work all the time as well. Sometimes they're taught, it's like the parallel lines on a train track and they work together. And of course, Paul writes to the Romans after talking about some of these things, you do know that all things work together for good, don't you? You do know that God has got all this in his hand for those who are called according to God's purpose. You do know that, don't you? You do know that if there's anyone who can be trusted with all of this, that it's God. And this is why this is holy. Because we're dealing with holy th things that we don't really understand and we're never going to this side of heaven. But we submit to God's eternal, sovereign and good plan for his world. For his world. So G Judas took the bread and walked away. <coughs> but what about us? See, nobody naturally runs to Jesus. And here's the thing for us. We would all naturally betray Jesus. We do it. So when the disciples are saying, is it me? Is it me? We could have asked that question this morning. Lord, is it me? Would I betray? Every time we choose to sin over against following Jesus, we're betraying him. So we could all sit here this morning and say, is it I? And we're all in one sense betrayers. Lest we just put Judas in a category of his own. He's not. He's a sinner. He's walked away from God. The difference between somebody who walks away to the night and somebody who walks away to the light, to Jesus, is one who does that exactly. Walk, one who walks away from Christ and one who walks towards him. Who takes the bread, who eats the bread and drinks the cup and proclaims what Jesus has done in their heart and accepts what he has done on their behalf. If, so those of us who, when we're in that point, when we come to the communion table, it's important for us to, we're going to look at this in a second, but it's important for us to recognise what's happening. We once again are being confronted with our sinful nature and we have to reject that and run to Jesus. And by taking these emblems, that's exactly what we're saying. Not the emblems themselves. It's signifying to the world, it's a witness to the world that we have run to him. We're not walking away into the light. And that's our responsibility, folks. Most of us here would we'll, we'll do that, wouldn't we? But we, we, we should all say the same thing. Lord, is it I? Am I betraying you? Is there any part of my life that's betraying you as my saviour and my Lord? And we come back and we remember what Jesus has done, the communion and all the rest of it, but just come to him and bow our knees towards him so, and, and, and accept the fact that, yes, we are pronounced guilty, but we run to the saviour who's offering us the bread and the wine and say, we want you to forgive us. Because we know that's our only hope. And that's what's going on here. We take the bread and we drink the wine in a desperate plea for mercy. We come to the table on our knees, repentant in our hearts. No one comes to this table singing and dancing. That's why it's a solemn occasion. We come on our knees with hearts full of repentance. And only those who've been convicted by the Holy Spirit about our sin with a repentant heart. Only those people can really do that. And that's God's sovereignty part of it. Which we know nothing about. And we don't interfere with. But by his grace. And here's the word isn't it. By his grace we are led to come on our knees. We are led to take the bread and the wine. Not as, not as, 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 as uh, crucial elements in all of this. In that sacramental way. But in the way that it, it, we're saying. Lord I am, this is a sign that I am running to you. I have run to you. And I know that you are my saviour. Your blood has been shed for me. Your body has been broken for me. And without that, I would be nothing. I would be the betrayer Judas going out into the night. I'm not walking into the night, Lord. I'm walking into the light with you. That's the transaction that takes place. And this is holy ground, isn't it? Whenever we have that moment where we decide for Jesus in our mind, that's a holy moment. But we don't just do the communion tables or when we come to church. 
every single morning we get up. I mentioned last week, every single morning we decide to lay our lives once again on the altar of service to God. Every single day we get up and say, I'm I am crucified with Christ. I'm dying to myself. And I'm running to Jesus. Which is what happens there, isn't it? And because, the, because and Jesus here, the, the terrible thing, woe to you, is there's a sense in which the, the Saviour is sorrowful here for what Judas is going to face. Better that he hadn't even been born, the terrible judgment that's going to come on Judas Iscariot as a result of his failure to turn and run to Jesus. And that's the warning for all of us, isn't it? The awfulness of it there. Woe to that man, the sorrow of the Saviour for the sinner. Offering, offering the bread of forgiveness right to the end. So people this morning, I don't know if there's anyone here, are you, have you rejected Jesus? Are you rejecting him? He's offering that to you again. This maybe for the first time you've never taken hold of his hand, as it were, and grasped onto it and claimed his forgiveness for your sin because you really need to realise that you need to come on your knees and bow in repentance. And the only way to forgiveness is to take the bread, as it were. Not the bread, the physical bread, but the, to accept that Jesus died for you, that it represents his body, to accept that Jesus' blood was shed for you so that he could take the punishment for your sin. You run to that light in desperation. Don't refuse it. Jesus in control. Jesus betrayed. And finally, Jesus the servant king, verses 14, sorry, chapter 14, 22 to 25, the last few verses. Despite what was about to take place, we see Jesus, after all this, serving his disciples. He's already served them by washing the feet, John tells us in John 13. And now he's serving them the, the supper. He's given the bread and he's in control of it all. This is called, when we meet together around God's table, that's what we do. And Jesus institutes it, as it were. It's often called the Lord's Supper, or some churches call it Eucharist, which is Thanksgiving. Some churches call it Communion, or the Lord's Table. And often we refer to it in Scripture as the Last Supper, but in many ways, it's the first of a new type of supper. It would be right to call it that in many ways. Let's read. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So while they were eating, all this happened. As we said, it's a normal Passover meal in many ways. Of course, there was some backdrop to it in the disciples. There would have been some kind of intrigue hanging in the air. While they're eating, Jesus says, this meal that you've been celebrating, which is all about history, is being fulfilled here, and it's now all about me. Now, if he was a madman, if, if, if he wasn't Jesus, he'd be mad to be saying that. But it's all about me. This, this, this bread that we're eating, this wine that we're drinking, is all talking about me. And Jesus just tells them about it in a very simple way. He's now God's son who's come from heaven to rescue them. They're not thinking back to Moses now. We're thinking, but this is me. I've come from heaven. And he's making it all about him. This is the new covenant. The old covenant was the lamb and the doorposts and God's presence with them as a result of that. Now there's a new lamb, a lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's me, he says. And it's my blood that's been shed now that is your guarantee of salvation. It's my body that's been broken that is your guarantee of salvation. He's the lamb of God. Whose blood sets us free. The bread and the wine are pictures of that. That's why we take them together. They're, they're important. They're pictures to, so we could remember him. We eat and drink to remember him. We take them. And that word take is so important. It's heavy with meaning. It means absorb them. Um, appropriate them. We take hold of Jesus in the bread and the wine. We don't take hold of him physically. But we, as, we, as, we, as we willingly in our hearts remember again and submit to Christ as we come to the table... As we said before, on bended knees, humbly remembering what Christ has done for us, we take the bread from him and we take the wine and we say, thank you. That's why it's a Eucharist. To remind us of what cost... What it, it's to remind us of what... These bread and wine remind us of what it cost him. This bread and wine reminds us that we need to respond in repentance. To 
to remind us that we're totally dependent upon him. And our only food, John talks about it a lot more in his gospel, about how we need to feed on that daily. Not physically, but we need to feed on his presence with us. Feed on what he's done for us. Never wander too far away from the cross, is what the old Puritans used to say. But it's true. The cross before me, the world behind me. Keep on remembering that. And the, and the tomb, of course, because we see in verse 25 the hope that comes. With this. It's not, it is heavy, but also Jesus, in the midst of all of this turmoil, points us to the future. Verse 25. Truly I tell you, I won't drink this again from the fruit of the vine. Sorry, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What's he saying there? He's saying that one day this is all but the, the, the fourth cup that they would have in this Passover meal would be the cup of consummation, they would have called it. And it's looking and they would be looking forward to the day when the Messiah would come. Well, Jesus is saying, I'm not going to drink that cup because things haven't been consummated yet. One day they will. And that's the cup I'll drink with you when I'm sat at the table with you in the presence of our enemies. That's the cup when it will be all finished and all be done and everything will be as it should be. And that's only going to be possible, yes, because Jesus died, but he points us also, not just to Good Friday, but to Easter Sunday and an empty tomb and a glorious, risen, triumphant saviour who will one day return and take us to be with him. This is what it's all been for. It's what it's all about. Jesus in control. Jesus betrayed. And Jesus the servant. So how can we apply this this morning just as we finish? It's fairly obvious in some ways, isn't it? We've already said it as we've gone along. But if Jesus is in control always, then why would we fear? What are we wrestling with him about? Trying to wrestle control back off him. Rather than yielding to his control in our lives. Will we trust Jesus? with everything, truly, even when you don't understand and, the, and events seem to be going out of control, will we continue to trust the one who controls everything? The wind and the waves obey him. It's lovely when he goes, shush, shush, in the video. It's as simple as that to him. Jesus betrayed. Is it me? How am I betraying Jesus in my own life? Do I realise, am I battling the sin that's in my life? Am I just tolerating it and living with it? Or am I battling it and treating it, as the old Puritans used to say, mortifying it, killing it? Am I learning? Of course we can run to Jesus. Of course we can know his forgiveness. But am I realising how much this, it cost him to deal with this, my betrayal? How do I approach him? What do I know of the grace and forgiveness of Jesus? Am I serious about this? Because we all have to, don't we? That's a sombre thing to think about. And for those who are in the danger of being a Judas, if you like, have we just walked away from Jesus too many times? Is it time that you didn't do that? And you didn't walk out into the night, but you walked into the light this morning. And Jesus, the servant king. Jesus is not just your life coach. He isn't just standing here and the scriptures aren't just for a better way of life. Or a nicer standard of living. Or some more hope and a bit of comfort for us or whatever. A little verse here, a little verse there. This, what we talked about this morning, is the, is the heart of it all, isn't it? And that's why we have to be serious about it, don't we? Again, many of us from many times over. He is your king. He is your captain. The good shepherd who walks ahead of you through every day of your life. And he will be with you until the day that he, he comes or he calls you home. And then for eternity. That's who Jesus is. We sung about him. I want to know you, Jesus, my Lord. Do we? Yes. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I want to know you. He's your king. So will you bow in worship to him? Will you give it up? Christian, you stubborn Christian. Will you not give it up for him? And trust him. And stop wrestling. And let him work his power in you. Because that's what he died for. That's what he rose again for. And that's what the Holy Spirit puts into our heart. So, God has spoken to us this morning through his word. We need to respond, don't we? Let's bow our heads and let's be quiet for a moment or two as we think about these things. And then we'll sing as usual.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, we know these are, these are important words, Lord, as they all are. But particularly today, as we said, it's almost like holy ground because we're, we're dealing with the point where your agony comes and, and everything that you do, Lord, against the reason for it, and that's us. And so, Lord, we come again with our hearts touched by your Holy Spirit, Lord, touched by you and our, our need for repentance and our need for, and Lord, how we have betrayed you in the way that we've lived our lives at times. And Lord, we are so sorry and we want to put our lives as it were and we cling to you again this morning. We lay our lives on this altar again and Lord, we pray that you would lift us up, you would equip us, Lord Jesus, and help us to serve you as we go from here. In Jesus' name we pray.